as Margaret mentioned, I, I teach international business transaction, law and economics, law and technology, and um, intellectual property and antitrust. Um, I'm a, I'm a practicing attorney, so I, I, I have some experience on those areas. Um, and I can tell you on first hand that um, it is true that um, practicing law uh, with different jurisdiction is an everyday thing uh, all over the world today. Okay, perhaps for you in the European Union is something this usual because you have the European Union legal system and then you have your own legal system, the Spanish legal system, the French legal system, the German legal system, and um, having uh, a, a multilateral issue uh, in your legal practice is going to, I won't say an everyday thing, but it's going to be a pretty common thing uh, because it's like in the US having a contract between, uh, I don't know, Ohio and uh, Illinois, it can be having a contract between France and Germany with the only difference that you have two different legal systems between the French and the Germans, and you don't have two completely different legal systems between uh, Illinois and Ohio, okay? Now, when you are uh, um, talking about uh, international law, at least from the business perspective, you have something known as legal risk. Okay, so the, the legal risk is about the idea um, that um, what are the what are basically the technicalities of a legal system that can affect the transaction that is taking place in different jurisdictions? Okay, um, this is the idea of legal risk. So, for example, you are having a contract between Spain and Argentina, and you have a breach of a contract, and you have a problem of uh, 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 non-performance in good uh, deliveries, in the deliveries of the goods. Okay, where are you initiating the actions? In Spain or in Argentina? Which law are you going to apply? These are typical questions that you will be uh, addressing in your private international law course. I know that with Susanna you are taking public international law, but after that you will understand the issues of jurisdiction and applicable law, okay? Now, uh, this does not mean that you must become an expert on every legal system in the world, because that's impossible. I, I, I know nobody which is an expert in uh, every legal system in the world, but um, what it is important for you is that you have a kind of a, um, some idea um, of how legal systems tend to think, okay? How people from other jurisdictions tend to think. So basically, how uh, does uh, a U.S. attorney think? Okay, what's the way of legal reason, all right? So I, I pick up some areas of law. Uh, might not be your favorite areas of law, but this, those are just examples. Then we can move to areas of law that might be of your particular interest, all right? So I, I pick up uh, antitrust, okay, uh, competition law, basically, um, intellectual property, and uh, data protection law, all right? Uh, and I'm going to provide some examples on how important it is to have a multilateral knowledge, a globalized knowledge on legal system in these three areas, all right? Um, so let's begin with antitrust, okay? Um, you know that you have some uh, European um, antitrust system, okay? Uh, which was founded in the in the 50s and is, is being has been shaped for uh, with the treaties of the European Union. Okay, today Article 101 and 102 of the European Union treaties, and you also have um, on the other side of the Atlantic the U.S. legal system, which in fact was the first antitrust system. Okay, uh, which was the Sherman and the Clayton Act back from 19, early 20th century. Uh, the European legal system is uh, in, around the 50s, okay? Uh, uh, talking about the antitrust arena. So why is it important to have um, antitrust uh, perspective in a globalized world? Well, because you are having globalized cases, okay? Um, so one of the most famous cases that everybody's I assume that you are aware of, even if you have not had an antitrust class so far, is uh, the tech firms, 
okay? Facebook, Amazon, um, uh, Google. So what is considered a violation to antitrust regulation in the US can be considered an antitrust violation in the European Union. Uh, why does it matter? Well, it, it matters because uh, if it is in one jurisdiction, but it, it is not in the other one, then how can you enforce uh, a decision in the US in Europe, considering that um, the behavior that is harming the market is the same on both sides of the Atlantic, okay? So for example, uh, let's assume about uh, predatory pricing. So if Amazon is doing some predatory pricing or price discrimination in Europe, is performing price discrimination in the US. So it's going to be hard to find um, a behavior that can be punished in one jurisdiction and go without any kind of punishment in another jurisdiction. So is that possible? It can be, but in order to achieve that result, we need to have harmonized antitrust legislation. Do we have that? Not so far, okay? Um, that's why, um, and uh, I'm just going to mention the example, if you are interested in this, then I will be happy to provide some more technical details. But um, in, in the early, uh, in, in the last decade, 2013, 2017, you have a, an Apple case. Apple was brought to trial by the antitrust authorities on both sides of the Atlantic, meaning the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission in the US and the antitrust authority in the European Union because of um, concert, concertating prices um, on the e-books, all right? Now, uh, was um, Apple found liable? It was in the European Union, okay? Uh, it was found guilty of infringing the Article 101 of the Treaty of the European Union. But it was not found so liable in the US. Why was that? Because the antitrust uh, legislation in the US is different from the antitrust legislation in the European Union. Okay, uh, so far antitrust has been one of the most complicated areas in trying to uh, arrive to a harmonization phase. So if we start talking about area, other areas of international law, uh, in fact, we can discuss some areas of uh, um, international law that you might be discussing with Susanna, human rights. Okay, we, we have arrived to a certain level of harmonization of human rights, um, however, even in human rights, you will find differences. If you compare the uh, European Charter on Human Rights with what is considered human rights in the US, you will find difference there too. Well, in business law, you have a tend to harmonize in two, okay? Because people tend to want to make transactions safer, but in antitrust, this is an exception. There are reasons for that. Basically, the economic development of the countries are different, and antitrust is very related to uh, the uh, economic development of countries. So what is happening in antitrust now? Agencies are trying to collaborate because of what we have seen on the um, big tech firms. Okay, I, I, I'm sure that you have been aware of uh, big tech firms are being prosecuted in, in the US uh, for certain type of behaviors and the US authorities are realizing that the legislation that they have is not good enough. Why not? Because uh, the test that you usually run in order to find out if you are infringing market competition uh, are becoming useless for tech firms. To keep it simple, um, if you charge monopoly price, you are um, infringing antitrust uh, legislation. But this is, this is not how it works with tech firms. And you have a very interesting case in the European Union, WhatsApp. Facebook bought WhatsApp some years ago. Uh, and that merger was authorized by the antitrust authority in the European Union. So uh, from one day to another, Facebook was managing the two most famous uh, messenger uh, application at that moment, the Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. So Facebook was becoming a monopoly. 
So you might have thought, okay, then price will rise. It didn't happen. WhatsApp remained free. You can use WhatsApp for free. Why? Because they want your data. They are not interested in charging you higher prices. They are not acting like a traditional monopoly. So the problem is that legislations are changing all over the world. And because of differences that we can discuss, if you're interested, um, there are some stones that prevent them to harmonizing um, antitrust regulations all over the world. This is not an, something US, European Union. It's worldwide, okay? Now, let me move a little bit about uh, intellectual property. Uh, you might really realize that I am not following the, the slides uh, uh, literally, and that's because there are some technical issues that I'm skipping so that I can remain in a plain language for you. But if you want to discuss something, please let me know. The only thing is that I'm just seeing a couple of you and I'm not seeing the chat. So if there are questions in the chat, I'm not seeing those, okay? Um, now, let me turn to intellectual property. Intellectual property is easier topic for understand. Uh, easier in the sense that it's, uh, it's more tangible, okay? Uh, everybody, antitrust is like more of a kind of a cryptic thing that unless that you are very related to that area of uh, practicing in, in the legal market, you are not familiar with antitrust. But intellectual property, everybody is, is aware about trademarks, uh, copyright, and patents, okay, which are the three most famous intellectual property rights. They are not the only ones, but are the most famous. So, what about, why do you need to know things about other legal systems if you are uh, interested in, intell in intellectual property? For example, um, scope of patentability. What is the scope of patentability? Um, the scope of patentability is what can be patent, okay? And what can be patent is not the same all over the world, okay? Uh, what can be patent was traditionally a huge concern for the United States, okay? Uh, traditionally, in fact, if you take a look on the proceedings uh, of the one of the most important treaties so far in intellectual property, which is the TRIPS agreement, you will see that there was a lot of interest in the U.S for uh, a right to a stronger patent protection. And what about the European Union? Well, you, of course, you, you were interested in a, a strong patent protection too, but you were more concerned with something different, denomination of origins, okay? Uh, like prosciutto di Parma, okay? So you can only say that the, the, the prosciutto is from Parma if it is manufactured in Parma, Italy okay, or the champagne, all right, or the uh, queso roquefort. You cannot call roquefort anymore. Uh, you can call it blue cheese, all right, or queso azul. Why is that? Because those are denomination of origins. The U.S. was concerned about that? Not so far, uh, not so much, uh, because they, they don't have so many denomination of origins. Yes, they do have some, the bourbon from Kentucky, all right, that's a typical U.S. domination of origins. You don't have bourbon, you have scotch, but it's not bourbon, okay? So those are the differences in, in, in intellectual property. Now, have we achieved a global level of intellectual property? Not yet, like in antitrust. We are working on, but we are not there yet. So understanding the similarities and the differences in the legal system are key, okay? Why? Because if something happened in the, in, in, the, in the European Union, an antitrust violation says, okay, I'm going to initiate actions in the European Union and in the US. Wait a minute. You don't know if the behavior that is going to be punished in the European Union is going to be punished in the US. Same with intellectual property. For example, let's go to the clearest example, copyright. Do you have copyright? You do not have copyright, okay? There is no single country in continental Europe with copyright. You have to add a term, derecho de autor, which is different from copyright. Copyright was created in England, okay? In the United Kingdom, not in continental Europe. We have the French variation of copyright, which contains certain, uh, 
similarities, but also differences. In fact, your uh, European Court of Justice has made a great work trying to harmonize the level of protection of the different copyright regimes in the different European countries. Okay, so we have a harmonization picture so far. The harmonization picture achieved is the TRIPS. Uh, what were harmonized? Well, at least the uh, length of the patent, which is the length of a patent in Spain, 20 years, which is the length of a patent in, in Argentina, 20 years, and in the US, 20 years. Okay, why 20 years? Because the TRIPS says so. And all the countries which are WTO members are TRIPS members. So it is the same for all the countries. But uh, what about copyrights or derecho de autor? Do we have the same level of protection? Mm, uh, no, we have a minimum 50 years. But there are countries with other length. For example, um, the US used to have 50 years, then they moved it to 70. Argentina, have 70s since the um, 1930s, okay? Now, some people tend to think that this is a good level of protection and a good level of harmonization. Some other tend to think that this is not enough and they are looking for more. So you have something known in the IP war known as TRIP plus agreements, okay? So a new kind of agreement you have, okay? The European Union, for example, you have a TRIP plus agreement with Jordan. OK, the United States uh, has three plus agreement with uh, Chile, with Panama, with Colombia. Uh, so there are a lot of new type of agreements. Now, why it's important to understand how uh, to reason about IP? Because as I said, the IP rights are not equivalent all over the world. So um, clinical trials, the data generated in clinical trials. now. All of us are experts on clinical trials because of the COVID vaccine. So everybody have heard about phase one, phase two, phase three. Everybody knows about that now. Okay, so what about the protection of clinical trials all over the world? How do you protect the, your clinic, the data generated in clinical trials in the European Union? Is it the same as in the US? No, it is not. Okay, and it is not the same in Argentina. So we, or even we have reached some harmonization where we still have loops, all right? Um, so let me provide with, the, to my uh, humble opinion, the, the clearest example. Seeds, okay? Key issue for one of the most controversial topics uh, in today IP landscape, IP and agriculture, okay? Because this is closely related with uh, human right and sustainable development. Can you patent a genetically modified seed? In the US, you can. In the European Union, you cannot. You have other way of protecting that, which are the UPOP agreements. You created your own IP right, okay? Your own IP right. In Argentina, we follow the same system that you have in the European Union, and seeds cannot be modified, uh, cannot be patented in Argentina either. But in the US, if you want, to protect a seed, you should not go for the breeder's right, but you should go for a patent. That's why you must know how the US system works, okay? Um, now, we are talking about the technological revolution. Uh, a lot of people are talking about technological revolution and how technology is affecting uh, our lives. Uh, and this brings new challenges to the legal practicing. So, for example, imagine that a web page based in India allows a book that you have written um, to, to allow to download the book, okay? Uh, and there is another website, okay, uh, with a link to that web page based in India, okay? So basically, you have a web page in the US, you enter to that web page, you have a link. You click on that link and then you go to a web page in India allowing to download a book that you have written. Needless to say that that is a violation to your copyrights, to to, uh, to derechos de autor, all right? Because somebody uh, is allowing to download books that you have written without paying you a penny, all right? 
So copyright infringement is taking place. So a, a client uh, is suffering this situation and knock on your door uh, in Spain, in Valencia, and ask you, listen, I have this problem. What do you recommend me to do? It's OK, this is a copyright infringement, right? You're right. Where are you going to initiate action? In India? In the US? Well, technically, you will learn that in this type of cases, you must initiate actions where the tort is taking place. Now, which is the tort? The tort is downloading the book without the author authorization. Now, the book is being downloaded all over the world. So are you going to initiate actions all over the world to claim damages for every time that the book is downloaded all over the world? This is going to be a terribly expensive trial. Which law are you going to apply? We don't have an answer so far. So these are the key challenges that are coming now. You will have to make up your mind and pick up a jurisdiction and pick up an applicable law based on your private international law course. But knowing that there are a lot of possibilities and you pick up the most efficient for your clients. Now, how are you going to do that without knowing at least a little bit of the legal system on the other countries? It's going to be very hard. I'm not asking you to go to trial in the US if you are a practicing attorney in Valencia. Probably you will have somebody in the US representing you. But at least you must know, for example, the scope of damages that you can claim in the US, which can be not the same that you can claim in Europe. All right. And let me finish with this, which is one of the most controversial topics so far, which is data protection. OK, um, you must be aware of the last year decision of the uh, uh, European Court of Justice that it decided to remove the shield. Uh, according to which the United States was a safe harbor for transferring data from the European Union. OK, now. Everybody knows that data are a kind of a new goal for companies. Now, the way in which legal systems are protecting data is very different. You in the European Union are very jealous of your data. You have uh, one of the most advanced regulations, the GDPR. Uh, but this is not the same as all over the world. And in fact, it's not the same in the United States. OK. Uh, so this is something that you must be aware of, for example, if you are working in new technologies. I know that you have an upcoming event with uh, new technologies uh, hosted by Professor Hofmeister, which is an expert on the topic. The, my only aim in mentioning this case is just bring you to your mind the idea of thinking, OK, I must think on which are, which are the consequences uh, in order to advise a client to do different type of businesses, considering the legal risk, depending the area of law in which my client is involved or my client business is involved. I just pick up three, okay? Data, IP, and antitrust. Of course, this is kind of a, a summary of, um, uh, of the, the, the three topics. I can provide he a lot of examples on antitrust, a lot of examples on IP, and a lot of examples on data protection. But this is just for you to have a kind of a glimpse, um, a flavor of why it's important for you to understand how different legal systems work, OK? Um, to sum up, legal systems are important. And if you need to pick up a couple of legal systems, because as I said at the beginning, it is impossible for you to know every single legal system in the world. Well. You have to consider to have certain knowledge about the U.S. legal system. Why? Well, there's obvious geopolitical reasons, OK? I mean, if you take a look on your trade pattern between the U.S. and the European Union, you will see that your main partner in trade is the United States, OK? Um, but also because there is a, a, a legal concept that if you have a course in comparative law, you will learn it, which is known as legal transplant. OK, legal transplant happen basically where a legal institution migrates from one legal system to another. So because we are having this kind of a melting of legal system in order to try to achieve a harmonization of different areas of law, a lot of legal transplant are taking place. So sometimes you see an institution, this is, what does it come from? Well, it came from, from another legal system. And, and, and the US is a great source of 
uh, institutions, of legal institutions being transplanted into other legal systems. That's why it's important for you to have a, a kind of a knowledge of the US legal system. Okay, uh, that will be all on my side. So thank you very much uh, for your time.